Now we look at uh, chapter 11, which deals with angular momentum and torque. And in this chapter, the main focus of the chapter is going to be on the second part, uh, torque. And um, as we work through this chapter, I'd like you to, to look back again at this figure shown here, which shows two people sitting at different positions on a seesaw. And I'd like you to think about this figure and think about is this figure accurate? Is what's happening in the figure possible? Under which conditions would it be possible? Um, how or why would you, you uh, motivate your, your answer to these questions? So after this chapter, you should be able to uh, define uh, the concepts of uh, torque along with the, the concept of angular momentum. You should have gained knowledge regarding cross products, which we're going to use as the definition of torque. And then you should be able to apply the concept of torque to solve uh, problems. For me, it's also really important that you understand this uh, famous quote uh, by Archimedes, that you um, have some intuition for the physics behind it. He said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. Right, so let's get into the chapter and we start by um, discussing torque. So in this chapter, we'll consider the kinematics of rotation. So what we're going to be doing is considering the kinematics, which means that we're going to be considering the forces which bring about a motion related to rotation. When a force is exerted on a rigid object pivoted about an axis, axis the object tends to rotate about that um, axis in the next slide we're going to see some examples of this uh, rotation of this rotation and um, the tendency of the force to rotate an object about this axis is measured in some quantity called torque um, you may in your engineering work hear torque referred to by slightly different names um, you know it can also be known as a moment or a moment of a force. Uh, in this course, we're mainly just going to call it torque, but just be aware that when you hear these uh, terms in the future, um, they also refer to torque. In this slide, we have some examples of torque. And in the previous slide, we saw that torque is the, you know, the tendency of a force to rotate an object about some axis. And in each of these figures, what we have is a force causing a rotation of, of some object. So in the first uh, example we look at with this uh, seesaw and these two, two children, if we look first at this um, first child, he's sitting on this end, right? There's a force acting downwards. And what's going to happen? It's going to cause um, this, this beam, this whole beam to rotate this child will move uh, downwards and this child will move upwards. This is assuming that, you know, this child is heavier than, than this child, of course. But what we have is some force, which is the force of gravity pulling this child down, causing the, the beam to rotate. It's going to move in an anti-clockwise direction and it's going to be rotating about some axis. In this case here, the axis will be um, this this point here. Um, you know, it's the point about which the beam will will pivot, or the or the motion will will take place. Um, in Archimedes' quote, he referred to um, "Give me a lever and a fulcrum." Uh, that word "fulcrum" refers to um, a point uh, uh, on which uh, about which the rotation would happen. A point on which you know. A the lever could be could be rested um, when he spoke of a, of a lever. Other examples where, where torque might uh, take place is if you have a spanner, right? You might be trying to use one of these two spanners to, to undo um, a nut. So basically you would be applying some force to this handle. If you wanted to tighten the nut, you would be turning this handle in, in the clockwise direction. So we would have some force uh, causing a rotation of this spanner about an axis. And in this case, the axis would be where the nut is, is situated. 
here's another example. This this refers more to Archimedes' quotes. And um, here we're making use of a, a crowbar and we apply a, a force uh, downwards to you know cause a rotation of this endpoint and lift this uh, crate. Um, here's another example where we're using the head of a of a hammer to to pull out a, a nail again a force is being applied in in this direction um, causing you know a rotation of this um, this beam or this 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 hammer bar another example is that of a screwdriver shown here you know when we use a screwdriver we we um, grasp the handle and then we apply some force some twisting force where we cause the screwdriver head to you know rotate and um, for this case the axis is along the along the length of the the screwdriver that's the axis of the rotation so once again then um, a torque is um, when we have a force being applied to an object and as a result of that force we get some rotation of the object um, about some axis. Here's an example that refers to different approaches or techniques you could uh, use to you know, close a door by applying a force. So they say, imagine you are trying to rotate a door by applying a force of magnitude F perpendicular to the door surface near the hinges and then at various distance from the hinges. You will achieve a more rapid rotation for the door by applying the force near the doorknob than applying it near near the hinges. So you can try this for yourself on your um, door at your house. But essentially, if you if you push on on the door at this point here, you know, close to the hinges, it's going to be more uh, difficult to uh, to close the door. Whereas if you if you apply a force over here and you push perpendicular to the door at this point, you know, further away from the hinge, then you're going to find that that the door will um, close a, a lot easier. This has got to do with the fact that even though you could be applying this or you are applying the same force in each of the two cases, you applying the force at a different point on the door. And as a result of this, uh, in the second case, when you apply your force further away from the hinge, um, you, you generate more torque and the door closes uh, more easily. So we already have a good intuition of what, um, of what a torque is, but now it comes for us to come up with a mathematical uh, formulation of what it is. In work that we did previously, we uh, saw that there's a way to multiply two vectors called the dot product, but there's actually a second way to multiply two vectors, which is called the, the cross product. And what we're going to deal with in this slide is some background into what a cross product is. So when dealing with a, a cross product, imagine that we have two vectors and uh, our two vectors are, you know, A and uh, B and we would like to calculate the cross product between vector A and B so the way we we say that is we would like to calculate what C is where C is A cross B so we define the the length of vector C or you know the, the magnitude we define that as the magnitude of A multiplied by the magnitude of b multiplied by sine of theta where theta is is the angle between the two so this will give us the 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 magnitude of of the cross products and um, we need to to be careful because cross product is in fact also a vector you can see i've written i've used vector notation for c so it means apart from uh, C having a magnitude given by this, C also needs to have a direction. And the direction for C is given by the right hand rule. And when we want to you know, apply the right hand rule, what we do is we, we take our hand uh, as, as shown 
and we take our fingers and we curl uh, our, our fingers of our right hand in the direction of, of the cross product. So applying, um, applying this right hand rule to, to this situation, we found out that um, A cross B, we point our fing fingers in the direction of A and we curl them towards B. And then we see that our thumb is pointing up out, out the page. Our thumb is pointing up out the page. So under these conditions, A cross B is a vector of given by this magnitude, which points in the direction of our thumb out the page. The direction of a cross product is always perpendicular to the plane formed by the two vectors. And this means, you know, the, the plane formed by, by these two vectors is, is the page. So the, the cross product is always going to be perpendicular to the page. Uh, we may have a, a different uh, cross product. You know, there would be two ways to, to calculate the cross product with these two vectors. We may be interested in, in defining a new vector D, where D is the cross product of B cross A. Well, the magnitude of vector D would be the same as for vector C, in that, you know, the magnitude of, of vector D is going to be BA sine theta, which is, of course, exactly the same as for, for C. But the direction is going to be different for D. To find the direction of D, we again take our right hand and we point our fingers along the direction of B this time and we curl our fingers towards A. And doing this, we find that our thumb uh, points into the page. So the direction for the, the dot product of um, B cross A is in fact going to be uh, into the page and the magnitude is going to be given by this. Um, it's a little tricky to illustrate the right hand rule on the webcam, but I'd like you to, you know, give it a try at home and see if you can can arrive at the same same conclusions in the same directions as me. Let's take a look at how what we've just discussed is summarized on this overhead page. So what we've been given is two, two vectors A and B and we've defined C as A cross B. Of course, we've seen the magnitude will be given by the magnitude of A cross uh, multiplied by the magnitude of B multiplied by sine of theta, where theta is the acute angle between A and B. So what they're referring to here is um, theta is always going to be an angle which is acute, which means it's less than 90 degrees. So uh, in terms of, of our diagram that we had, we're using this small little angle between the two and not not the bigger outside angle and um, the the next point we're given is that uh, c is perpendicular to the plane formed by a and b so you can see here the angle is is 90 degrees and the direction of uh, c is given by the right hand uh, rule um, you know um, a cross b is is out the page and B cross A is, is into the page as we, we've already seen. We move on now to define torque. And for our definition, we have some situation where we have an axis about which a rotation is occurring. We have a force being applied to some lever or some arm. And then we also have a position uh, vector. And the position vector is the vector which points from the, the point where the, um, the, the axis of rotation is to the point where the force is being applied. And torque then is defined as the cross product of this position vector R and the force being applied. So it's R cross F, where as I've already said, R is the position vector and F is the force being applied. Torque has units of Newton meter, so Newton times meter. And of course, the origin of this is that force has units of Newton and the position vector um, has units of meters. Once again, uh, torque is a vector. So when it comes to calculating the magnitude, 
then we use the definition of, of the cross products and the magnitude of the torque is going to be given by the magnitude of R multiplied by the magnitude of F times sine of theta. For the direction, we use a convention where if the rotation is counterclockwise, the sign is going to be positive. And if the rotation is clockwise, it's going to be negative. This convention that we're deciding to use is different to the right hand rule, but nonetheless uh, having the positive and negative signs to represent counterclockwise and clockwise rotation, it makes it very convenient in, in adding different torques, as we'll see in, in the next problem. Um, in order of applying and knowing which direction the rotation is, it will take place, you need to use your imagination and take a look at the picture. You can imagine if this force is being applied, it's being applied in, in sort of an, an upwards direction, and this is going to cause the whole spanner to rotate, you know, in, in the direction as shown, which is, is the counterclockwise direction. So for this case, we would have referred to this torque as a, as a positive torque. If a force was acting in some downward direction, then this would be pulling the spanner downwards, right? And we would have rotation in a clockwise direction. So in that case, we would have assigned um, a negative sign for clockwise torque. These various concepts can perhaps better be understood though through less talking and looking at an example. So the example that we're going to look at is um, one where we have some cylinder and two forces are being applied. There's one force is being applied in, in this direction and another force is being applied downwards. Um, and the two forces are T1 and T2. The two forces are being applied at different points. We can see this one's being applied at, at a distance R1 and this other um, force is being applied at a distance R2. Each of these forces are going to be causing um, a rotation. This, this force is going to be causing the, the cylinder to spin in, in this direction, right, which is clockwise. And this force is going to be, force T2 is going to be causing the, the cylinder to spin in the opposite direction, in the, in the counterclockwise direction. Uh, we also have an axis of rotation. The axis of rotation is the Z axis. So we recognize this immediately then as a torque uh, problem. The question gives us the values of T1, R1, T2 and R2. And it asks us what is the net torque about the rotation axis? And which way does the cylinder start rotating from rest? So in order to solve this uh, problem, we go on to use, start with the, the definition of torque. And the, the definition of torque is, of course, R cross F. For us to calculate the magnitude, we're going to use RF sine theta. And uh, we're going to use the, the uh, conventions for the, for the different directions. We need, need to note that in our, our problem, we have two, two forces. Our two forces are T1 and T2, and these are going to, to um, bring about two individual torques. So we need to calculate the, when we want to calculate the net torque, we need to calculate the individual torques and add them together. Of course, also taking their signs into account. For the first term, we make use of um, this force acting here. So what we have is um, force T1, we have uh, position vector R, R1, and we have the angle between R1 and T1 is 90 degrees. And we note that force T1 is going to cause a clockwise rotation, and our convention for clockwise is a negative sign. So what we use then is R1 um, crossed with T1, and it's going to have magnitude um, R1 times T1 times sine of the angle between the two vectors, which is 90 degrees. And we've included our negative sign to show um, clockwise rotation. For our second uh, force acting, 
we have T2, which will cause um, a counterclockwise rotation. And in this case, we have an angle of 90 degrees again between the position vector R2 and the force. So um, in calculating the magnitude of the cross product, we use the sign being uh, positive to indicate a counterclockwise rotation. We use the magnitude of R2, we use the sine of uh, the magnitude of T2, and the angle between the two is uh, 90 degrees. We can go on then to substitute the values that we've uh, been given, substituting the values in for each of the two terms. We arrive at a final answer of plus 2.5 Newton meters. And the interpretation of this plus is that the direction of the rotation is going to be in, in the counter clockwise uh, direction. And of course, that was also asked for in, in the solution, right? We were asked to calculate the net torque. So the net torque will have magnitude of 2.5 Newton meters. Um, and which way does the cylinder start rotating from rest? So the cylinder is going to start rotating in the counterclockwise direction from rest. Here's a new question, and this question asks if you're trying to loosen a stubborn screw from a piece of wood with a screwdriver and you fail, should you find a screwdriver for which the handle is A, longer, or B, flat, fatter? And uh, question two is similar to that, but instead of uh, loosening um, a screw with a screwdriver, it says you're trying to loosen a stubborn bolt with the spanner. And once again, it's asking, should you use, you know, for the spanner, should you use a hand handle which is either A, longer, or B, fatter? For question one, we note that when we use a screwdriver, the axis of rotation is going to be along the length of the, of the screwdriver. And in this case, it will be better for us to have a screwdriver with a fatter handle. So... Um, the fatter this handle is, uh, the better. For the case of the screwdriver, if you want to understand why the fatter handle is better, I encourage you to take a look at this uh, picture here, where this cylinder might represent the handle. And as we saw, for a longer position vector, we get a larger torque. For the second question, where we're using a spanner to loosen a bolt, it refers to a picture such as this one shown here and in this case it's in it's actually better that the handle of the spanner be longer and if you want to understand why that's the case then uh, this is the relevant uh, picture for you to look at right you can notice that uh, if the handle is longer we have a longer position vector and then the overall torque will be will be greater with a larger R. So the difference between the spanner and the screwdriver, it's a subtle difference, but it's got to do with the rotation axis and it's got to do with um, how the forces are applied. Uh, that helps to determine whether a fatter or longer handle will be better in each case. So we conclude this chapter with the definition of angular momentum. And um, the example that we're given is a skater who's skating past a pole. And as she skates past the pole, she grabs hold of it, which causes her to swing around uh, in, in a circle as shown. Well, as she approaches the pole, she has some linear momentum, which would be given by uh, P, you know, the mass times her velocity. And as she grabs onto this pole and moves in a circle, her linear momentum is converted into angular momentum and the angular momentum is given as the cross product between the position vector and her, her linear momentum. Here the, um, the, the position vector is going to be related to the length of her arm right, relative to the pole which is the axis of rotation. Angular momentum is something you're going to deal with in more detail in second year so in this course 
we're not specifically going to solve problems relating to angular momentum and this is now the end of, of chapter 11.